Good afternoon and good morning for the West Coast. Uh, my name is David Bernstein. I'm president and CEO of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. I'm really delighted you all have joined us and I'm very, very excited about this uh, webcast with our special guest, David Makovsky. I know you probably know David or else you wouldn't be on this call, but David is really one of the foremost thinkers and practitioners of the Middle East peace um, David is with the uh, Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's a scholar there, been there doing great work there for many years. He's our go-to person on, uh, on Middle East issues, and he's, we've heard from him several times in the past year or so um, about some of the challenges we face in this region. Um, and uh, we're really delighted. And I, I've seen, David, your work um, on settlements. You've produced some very important maps, for example, that have helped us think about what the challenges are for settlements and the peace process. And um, I'm excited about this new project, which I've seen a beta version of, and I know you've made some, uh, I was excited then, and I'm even more excited now to see how far you've come in the, um, in the past several months since we've, I first saw uh, your work. And so with that, I'm gonna, we're gonna have you speak for uh, a while and show us your work and uh, educate us and people will be able to see for themselves the resource that you're bringing to bear. And we're gonna leave some time for questions as well. So uh, please think of your questions and please make them questions and you'll be able to type them in and I'll be able to see your questions and we'll, uh, we'll look forward to uh, posing some of them to David uh, at the, toward the end of the, the cast. So David, with that, please. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. And I want to thank you and Melanie Gorelick on your staff and, and the whole JCPA team for putting together this webinar. Also for your input on, on the beta uh, version. I want to thank uh, Ronnie Gazit, uh, who's here with me, who's been a coordinator. Leah Wiener, who's also been very helpful on, on, on my side in, in working on these maps. I, um, you know, I want to share with you what I think you'll find, I hope you'll find exciting. We launched this on uh, November 29th. It's not incidental. It was the 70th anniversary of, of the partition plan. And it's an interactive map that tries to look at the intersection between uh, the, the demographics of the settlements and the two state solution to ask really, is it too late uh, for two states? So I want to walk you through the project's background, its goals, relevance, and then walk you through the map itself, uh, and then really open it up for a discussion. So again, I want to thank JCPLA for, for putting it all together and for the, providing this opportunity for this webinar. So what, why do we do this? Um, look, we all know how bad things are now in, in terms of the depth of the impasse between Israelis and Palestinians. There's no direct talks. Uh, I think with developments in the last few weeks, um, I don't think we're likely to see an American peace plan uh, anytime soon. Uh, Abbas also gave a recent speech with some inflammatory rhetoric uh, that um, really, I think, makes me wonder if there, you know, if, if, if there's even, the PA isn't gonna collapse at a certain point. But the question is, is, you know, there's an argument out there that says Israel settlements are the reason why two states cannot happen. What I would like to do is not to, this is not about pro-settlements or anti-settlements, but it's really trying to provide a more precise geographic footprint of where the settlers actually are. Um, they're not evenly distributed throughout the West Bank. And that's the key inside, if, if you remember anything about this presentation. I'm not here to say that it's neat and easy solutions. It's not, it's messy and, um, you know, so that is, you know, that's clearly needs to be understood. But the point here is um, that the large part of the settlers live largely adjacent to um, the old 67, pre-67 lines. And we're going to get into how you count because if you count East Jerusalem or not, but the large majority are still largely adjacent to that, what we call the green line, which we'll show you on the map. Uh, but, the, but the point is that that gives me hope that it's not yet too late for two states. And it's imperative that we present the, the, the geographic distribution of this in a way that's, that's new and also for a younger generation that's more interactive and uh, you'll see with satellite imagery. Um, the, the point here is to really look at the intersection also between settlement activity uh, and different peace plans. 
because there have been settler websites before, um, but they tend to look at the settlements in isolation and not as part of how they intersect with peace plans. Could some be part of the solution if others are still part of a problem? So to make this interesting, we, we did aerial uh, imagery. We think this is the most precise and objective data uh, that you can get on the settlements. I've been, uh, you know, even from the biggest critics of the settler movement, uh, I've been very uh, pleased that when it comes to the data, people have felt that this is taking it to a new frontier. Uh, we actually commissioned an airplane to fly over every single settlement in the West Bank. Um, and therefore, we could provide an accurate map. You'll see that our satellite imagery, of course, is constrained uh, by Israeli law and, and American law, of course, is we're not interested in zooming in to a point that we're providing Hamas with uh, targets on, 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 on how to hit rockets or anything like that. So we play by the rules of American law and Israeli law in terms of the level of resolution. Uh, we, we stay within the... Uh, the parameters of those laws. Um, but you'll see that the inter interactive map will detail the geographic distribution and allow users to understand the activity of length at, 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 in depth, excuse me. And um, I think you will see that a, a settlement, a, a two-state solution is still possible. Uh, I, again, I don't claim, to claim it's a neat and easy. If it was easy, it would have been done a long time ago. Uh, I think it's relevant now, like I mentioned, the 70th anniversary of partition, which was the UN putting forward the idea of two states. Um, and uh, we, this is also, we just passed the 50th anniversary, not just the 70th anniversary of partition, but the 50th anniversary of the Six Day War, which brought the whole, uh, all of the West Bank into play. And of course, it comes in the backdrop in terms of a lot of discussions between Trump and Netanyahu. Uh, that are not always public, but clearly are, are saying if there's any add-ons to settlements, they have to be done in terms of existing built-up areas and uh, not outside that. So our, our view is it's not yet too late for two states. Now, why do we think that way? And we hope that, you know, that this is, uh, this will visualize for the readers, the viewers, you know, what would be part of Israel, what would be uh, part of a Palestinian state. And what our, our main point is, and again, if you remember anything, just remember this number that 85% of the Israelis who live beyond the June 4th, 1967 lines live largely within 8% uh, of Israeli urban areas. And that that's where the security barrier is. The barrier is not a border, and we're not here to put forward the barrier as a border. We think it has to be negotiated by the parties. But the fact that 85% of Israelis over the line live in 8% of the West Bank, largely adjacent to that line, tells me that this is not yet impossible. Uh, it's not maybe, uh, like I said, neat and easy, but 92% of the West Bank is outside that border. But 85% um, live inside the barrier, 15% live outside the barrier. If you count uh, East Jerusalem, if you don't count East Jerusalem, the number, the ratio goes from 85 to 15% to 77 and 23. Um, but I'm not here to minimize the number of people uh, outside the, that barrier, 15% uh, outside the barrier, living the 92% of the West Bank outside the barrier, uh, is still 97,000 people. Uh, just for a sense of balance, um, you know, a, a reference, uh, the Gaza pullout was 8,000. This is 97,000. So while the ratios have remained pretty constant uh, in, in, in the last several years, uh, at 8515, still absolute numbers mean something. And at the start of the Obama administration, maybe you had 70,000 people outside the barrier, and today it's 97. Um, so this whole question of east and west of the barrier are also important in understanding how the, the settlers vote, too. And we, we have pie charts, which we'll show you. 
But for the most part, if you're a settler who lives outside the barrier, you don't tend to believe there's any two-state solution that gerrymanders you inside. And so those voters tend to vote more for the Jewish Home Party of Naftali Bennett that is uh, against the two-state solution, although Bennett says the Palestinian uh, urban areas and their environs, what we call areas A, Palestinian urban areas, and the, the environs outside those urban areas, together 40% of the West Bank. So he's not calling for rolling it back, but he's saying, well, we shouldn't give any more. Uh, and Israel should keep 60% of the West Bank. Uh, but those, anyone who lives outside the barrier tends to vote for Bennett. Those who live inside the barrier who believe there might be a two-state solution with land exchanges, land swaps, often vote for Netanyahu in the larger places, and we'll come back to that. And uh, if they're in Haredi, ultra-Orthodox places, of course, they vote for the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox parties. The the smaller places, even inside the barrier, we've seen they've gone Bennett. We have pie charts for 139 settlements times three uh, for the last three elections. So you can look at over 400 plus uh, pie charts on this map, if you'd like. Um, I would say, though, what's interesting as, as we're going we're gonna to go to the map in a moment is to understand, though, where is the growth? And here... It's interesting that over the course of the year, 46% of the growth of the numbers of people, of settlers there, have come from two out of 139 places. And they're ultra-Orthodox. They don't fit the profile people have of settlers being national religious and the like. These are ultra-Orthodox people who, uh, where there's a housing shortage, and we're going to show you where the Tel Aviv housing shortage spilled over to one settlement and the Jerusalem housing shortage spilled over to another settlement. So two of the 139 settlements provided 46% of the growth, and, and you'll see that in a moment. So why don't we go now to, um, you know, to the actual map, and, uh, and so you get a sense of it, and uh, we can walk you through some of this. Uh, I would hope people get the swing of it, they will spend hours playing with it and they will discover uh, a lot of details. Uh, we don't have that time today. So when you enter the website, the first thing you see is the framing video um, inside this blue box. And that is the um, six minute video that contextualizes the maps, which I've just done for you and provides a, a brief history of the settler movement. I didn't get into all those details. Uh, but happy to answer those questions. Then the next screen, you'll find our major takeaways from the project. And so you kind of get a sense of some of the highlights. And, um, and those are some of the ones I, I've just mentioned. And then you can explore the political glossary, as you see now the white screen right in front of you, and a step-by-step -step tutorial on the website. I won't go through the tutorial now, so we could jump right into things. On the top right corner of the page, you will find what I call the FAQ box, frequently asked questions or 101. We don't want to assume any knowledge that even people know what is a settlement. Uh, we want this to be accessible. You know, we don't want people to need a PhD in settlement studies to go through this map. We want anybody to be able to access it. And we are going to be taking steps also in the coming months to really make it as even more accessible than it is now. Uh, but, but using this box, you can explore some of the most frequently asked questions when it comes to settlements and use this as your guide through the website. When a question is clicked on, the box will scroll to the answer and highlight for you the map uh, of, with the relevant button. And uh, for example, we're gonna click on the question, what is East Jerusalem? Um, and here you get a description of what is East Jerusalem and the key on the top left corner of the page that is highlighted. Um, and here you see that Israeli settlements are in blue, Jewish neighborhoods of East Jerusalem are in lighter blue, and Palestinian communities are in yellow. Scrolling back to the top of the page, I will now click on the question, what is the green line? I know many of you know this, or else you probably wouldn't be on the call, but in in case you don't know, it's a short description, and that appears in the box with the relevant widget, and, and in this case, the layers widget, it outlined in red. 
Um, and now I'm going to go to the layers with you. Just for those of you who don't know what the green line is, that's the, the pre-67 war line. Uh, it actually started um, with the armistice line and, and, and the green marker that they had in 1949. But uh, that's the line usually uh, that separates pre-67 and post-67. Now let's go to the layers widget. And within this widget, you'll find all the layers we have on the map. Population circles, Israeli settlements, outposts, the green line, the built and planned barrier, and so on. And you'll see, by the way, when we talk about the barrier, there is a difference between what has actually been built and perforated lines that was talked about planned, but it was planned really in 2002 at the height of the Second Intifada, where politically they did not want to upset certain settlers that they would be outside the line. So they said, we're thinking about it, we're planning it, we're working on it, but where it's perforated, you'll see that nothing has really changed much since 2002. So if it's a straight red line, it's been built, and if it's perforated, a dotted line, that means that they talk about one day we'll build it, but that 17 years later, uh, or 16 years later, that has not happened. Um, Scrolling through this, you'll see that there's some layers uh, defaulted on and other layers that are defaulted off. You can toggle it on and off with any of these layers. One of the layers that is defaulted off is the layers of A, B, and C. And I'm going to turn this one on. A, B, and C, for those of you who know, um, you, you know that is the under the Oslo Accords of the 1990s, uh, like I said, about 18% were Palestinian urban areas, and that's in the darker green, and then the environs outside the urban areas uh, were in the lighter green there, uh, that's 22%, and, uh, and uh, yellow is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the, you know, we see that as the villages, and uh, the blue are the Israeli settlements. Anything that's gray is 60% of the West Bank, uh, and that is still under Israeli uh, full control. Israel says it doesn't want to yield on these issues till they're in the final round uh, of what is known as final status, the final disposition of the territories. The U.S. tried on three occasions to solve this whole conflict. Clinton 2000, uh, 2007, 8 with Condoleezza Rice um, and Olmert and Abbas. The effort I was a part of uh, in the last administration, 2013-14. These were the three efforts to solve the whole thing. And uh, whenever you try to hit the home run ball, you're going to have a greater chance of striking out. But, um, but that's A, B, the ABCs of the West Bank are those three different land classifications. So that's that layer. And now I'll, I'll walk you through another widget, which we have on the website, which is the settlement query tool. And using this tool, you could calculate a number of classifications of settlement population in the West Bank. You could explore settlements east of the barrier, west of the barrier, west of the barrier without East Jerusalem, and so on. And we make the distinction here at the Washington Institute on uh, with East Jerusalem and without East Jerusalem because Israel does not consider neighborhoods in East Jerusalem as a settlement since Israel has annexed East Jerusalem. Um, if it didn't annex it, it would be much more clear cut. But since it did so, uh, we feel we need two sets of numbers. Uh, much of the world sees Ramad, you know, uh, Gilo, and these places as settlements. And so we thought, um, you know, to avoid confusion, we, we would have two sets of numbers, those including East Jerusalem and those uh, excluding East Jerusalem. And um, so now you see all the settlements west of the barrier are outlined in white. So you get a sense of uh, what is outside the barrier. And here, I, again, I think what's important, and I hope not, not, you don't get confused, is the distinction, this is critical to remember, between settlers and settlements. In other words, a majority of the settlers live in a minority of the settlements, while a minority of the settlers live in a majority of the settlements because they're smaller places, while the bigger ones, we call them blocks, uh, you can call them clusters, whatever you want. The large concentration of settlers is within the barrier, within this 8% uh, 
uh, closest to Israeli urban areas. And therefore, if there are land swaps, which we'll talk about in a moment, it's within the zone that Israel keeps, uh, you know, uh, maybe not fully 8%, but something close to that, and then yields a, a, a comparable uh, a, uh, amount of, of land to the Palestinians. So that's why the, the blocks and uh, uh, versus non-blocks, and this more differentiated view I think is crucial for our readers, our listeners, to uh, viewers to, to really get a sense of because I think that the bumper sticker is always, they all get lumped together. But I think that it's important for those of you who follow this subject closely to understand, uh, have a more differentiated view between those block settlements that could be part of the solution and uh, and uh, maybe not all the blocks will be. We don't take a position here on saying this is where the line will be. On a previous study I did, I put forward three different scenarios, but um, and we don't take a position that the settlers outside the barrier should be evacuated or they could want to they want to become uh, citizens of Palestine. That has to be negotiated by the parties. But what we're trying to get at is that uh, is that you you understand that the um, and we're going to go through the widgets of the different peace plans that are really at the core of this, that um, some of these settlements would be under Israel, even according to the Palestinian map. So um, you can look up any, um, any settlement in, uh, in the, here. Well, maybe we'll start with Beitar Elite, uh, which is south of Jerusalem. It's in the Gush Etzion area. And it, that and Modi'in Elite, which we'll get to in a moment, are really two of the fastest growing settlements. You don't hear about them as much. Uh, you've probably heard more of Malaya Dumin, uh, Ariel, but the, the two fastest growing settlement settlements, when I said the 46% growth in terms of population, it's in these areas. Now, Sharon, when he was in the 80s, wanted to get the ultra-Orthodox into the enterprise and to get them kind of inside the settlement tent. He understood that they didn't want to go venture too far from the green line, and he didn't ask them to do so, but he knew they had a housing problem because they were having so many children. And again, the Haredi birth rate is 6.9% uh, per mother, which is astonishing. Uh, it's, it's certainly higher than anything in the Western world we've seen. Uh, you know, critics will call it uh, unnatural growth. Uh, the truth is that numbers actually dropped, believe it or not. It was 7.5% uh, a few years ago, and it is dropping, but still 6.9 kids uh, versus, I think, the uh, secular numbers are like 2.8, which is high in the Western world, 2.8, but uh, it's certainly nowhere near 6.9. But so here, the Haredi uh, city of Beitari Lead, which is what, like 52,000 or so, um, near is really the overflow of the housing uh, shortages of Jerusalem, and it's virtually on top of the green line. So why don't we zoom in and show that to you? And uh, you're going to see here um, that's again we can only go as far as we're allowed to by law. So uh, whatever you're seeing is the maximum we're allowed to. This is uh, the city of Beitar Elite, uh, with its, uh, you know, it, it barely existed 20 years ago. While Ariel and Malaya Dumim have been rather flat, I would say, uh, Beitar Elite has come from nowhere and is now the second biggest settlement uh, of the West Bank. And uh, it's a Haredi settlement uh, dealing with housing shortages. A lot of these people have relatives in Jerusalem, and they just can't afford housing uh, in Jerusalem. So that, that's one. Uh, and now we're going to show you, and this is this settlement is included in Abbas's 2009 peace map, and uh, the, and Olmert's, of course, um, and, and we could come back to that. And another one, uh, but here, on the, if you look on the population tab, you can see a graph with the population of Beitari Lee. Look how it's gone up uh, year by year. And you could just like, you could put the, the mouse on different places. We'll give you the exact figure year by year. So you have all that. And then if you look at the, 
uh, the election tab, you can see how they voted in the last three elections. So anybody who's a political junkie when it comes to Israel, like I said, you have over 400 of these pie charts. And you could go uh, settlement by settlement and see how they voted in the last three elections. It's no surprise that overwhelmingly they vote for Haredi parties and a Haredi settlement. Uh, but anyway, you can go through that yourself. Finally, on the plans, tenders, and construction starts, you can see how the data uh, is going back here to 2009. And then by clicking on the uh, Zoom to button, the map will zoom into the settlement and bring up the aerial imagery, which, which we showed you, so you have a sense of that. And um, you can see the individual buildings. And uh, like I mentioned, um, it's one of the two settlements that account for 46% of the population growth over the last year. And, and together with uh, Modi'in Elite, which we'll get to now, it's uh, about 30% of the entire settlement population, uh, if you exclude East Jerusalem, I believe, that uh, is, is, is just two places that are virtually on top, uh, straddling the green line. Now, here's the other one. It's called Modi'in Elite. Some of you know the city of Modi'in. Uh, between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, maybe you have relatives there. Uh, but right next to it is a place called Modi'in Elite, which is technically over the line. And uh, here too, here the number is even higher. I think the number is like 69,000. Uh, so it is the number one settlement. I'm sure you can stump all your friends uh, in any trivia game because no one will know this. But that is the uh, number one settlement of Israel is, is Modi'in Elite, also Haredi also dealing with the overflow of housing shortages, this time in the B'nai Brock area, which is part of the Tel Aviv area. Um, so a lot of these uh, people are people from Hasidic groups and others that can't afford housing in B'nai Brock, and they move to uh, Modi'in um, and, and And you could look at, um, and here too, we'll show you the population, look how it's, how it's shot up in recent years. Uh, it, it might be just good to do a comparison to Ariel, and there you'll see that it's a much flatter uh, curve. Ariel might be one of the most controversial settlements. People have assumed that it, if there really was final status negotiations, it's kind of on the bubble. Uh, it's big enough, uh, close to 20,000, that it's called a city. It's got a university now, but the numbers have been rather flat in the last 15 years. So that's a little bit of a, of a contrast to uh, Modi'in Elite and Beitar Elite. Um, now let's look at this land swap options. This to me is, I think, really in some ways, really the, and, uh, the heart of the, of the story. And uh, I'll just make one more comment after, one more subject after this, but before I open it up. But I think it's really important that you understand these are the peace plans. I mean, we call them land swap options, we might rename it, but I think it gives you a feel of, of what was offered before. So let's go to, let's say, uh, the Olmert plan. And, uh, and there you could see that he hoped to keep uh, the, the aqua areas there, which is like 5.8% of the land mass. And, but in return, he was willing to give up what we call land swaps, meaning exchanges, territorial exchanges inside the green line. So you'll see a lighter yellow. Uh, here we go to the top corner there, yeah. Uh, you know, in the, above the Jordan Valley is an area where there are not people, and um, that is a land swap area under the Olmert plan. There's some other places, but the idea was to offset that Israel keeps some areas uh, inside the big settlement concentrations so you don't have to inconvenience uh, the settlers that they get to stay, that kind of win the lottery, that they're, they've been in a kind of a legal limbo with the land and now they are next in Israel. But in return, Israel yields uh, area uh, of about the same amount. Um, and that was one of the peace plans. So here you'll see which, which which settlements Israel would keep under Omer. And then look at the other end of the spectrum under Abbas. He also understood that Israel was not going to get out of these areas. He doesn't talk about it that much, and journalists don't seem to ask him that much about it. But he understood that among all the neighborhoods like East Jerusalem were going to be Israeli, except for one, Har 
that Jebel Ghanaim, which he said, you know, was founded after the Oslo Agreement, but he understood that some of these other areas would be Israel as well. So you, you could click on that. Uh, a little above that number is something called the Geneva Initiative. For those aficionados that follow this, you could see some of the, those land swaps uh, as well. So I just thought maybe since we try to also be current here, uh, I'll add uh, one point, which is something that's been in the news uh, today in the last few weeks, a place called Chavad Gilad or Gilad's Farm. And this will just give you a random sense. My hope is always that we try to be part of an understanding of people of day-to-day -day events so you get a sense. Now you see that dark blue area there? That is Chavat Gilad. That is right now an outpost. It is, um, it is right on Route 60, which is the main uh, north-south highway uh, of the West Bank. So for the Palestinians, it has a lot of significance, that road. It is the, so you have a sense of it. Now, you also see that it is surrounded by villages on the Palestinian side. So here, we could just flip on some of those villages to see how many people live there. And uh, so here's the, the settlement of, uh, of, I mean, the village of Tal, and that has, uh, you know, over 4,000 people. And, uh, and then, and, uh, okay, sorry, sorry about that. So Tal's got 4,600. Um, uh, we've got here the, the place called the, uh, 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 Sarah, I believe, uh, there's uh, Farata, um, down here, 635, Jit, 2243, um, and, and Imatim, uh, 2368. These are Palestinian Central Bureau statistics numbers. It should be said that there's been some question about these numbers. Uh, it's used, I believe, by the CIA fact book, which is an online, unclassified thing accessible to the world. Um, we could argue about some of this, but you just get a sense. To the northwest of there is, is Kedumim. It's one of the, uh, the earliest, one of the earliest settlements that is not considered a block settlement that is outside the, um, it is outside the barrier. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it has now about uh, what, uh, over 4,000 uh, or so uh, uh, settlers there. It is though listed, it seems that Chabak Gilad with 50 families is under, is listed under that settlement uh, uh, as well. So, you know, there people will ask that and say, will, uh, will, will, how will this work exactly? Uh, if you look, just to, we'll zoom out a little bit for a moment, and you will see, uh, I mentioned Ariel as, you know, some people, you know, that be one of the toughest issues to negotiate. So that's, you know, much, uh, you know, further south. I mentioned that that perforated line has not really been built uh, of settlements that Kedumim is at the edge of that fingertip. Uh, so Chabad Gilad would be there. That's why people have questioned, uh, you know, would that be part of Israel in any deal or not? I leave that to people's own uh, judgment, but uh, it's, we're not talking about an area that's in Gush Etzion, Malay Abdumim, Beitar Elite, uh, you know, Modi'in Elite, and the like. What happened there was a tragic story that uh, Rabbi Raziel Shevach was making his way to his house to this outpost and was murdered by a terrorist cell that shot at his car on Route 60, uh, several hundred meters away from the entrance gate. And at the funeral, politicians comment as happens at these things, they begin to make public statements and uh, Defense Minister Lieberman says, we will legalize this outpost and turn it into a settlement. But since then, Netanyahu, who was kind of burned during the Obama administration because of the timing of certain things, uh, visit of Vice President Biden and the like. The last thing he wanted was to announce a new settlement um, on the eve of Vice President uh, Michael Pence's, uh, Mike Pence's visit to the Knesset with a very uh, full-throated support of Israel. He didn't want to embarrass him, so he said, we're gonna, we'll discuss this later. And now today, 
He's in Moscow meeting Putin. And uh, someone said, why didn't you raise in the cabinet yesterday? He said, we'll discuss it later. But there's an expectation that Chabad Gilad will go from an illegal outpost. Illegal means that it's not authorized under Israel, but they've been living there for a while. They are not yet hooked up to the electricity grid because they're not authorized. It's a, you know, a wildcat settlement that way. But uh, the murder of this rabbi has led to uh, new attention on Chabad Gilad. And of course, opposition figures will say, you know, this is a tragic story of this rabbi, but we should make our decisions in Israel based on what's the strategic, uh, what's good for Israel strategically, not based on this incident or that incident. But this is a government that, um, you know, I think is very, uh, you know, was very sensitive to the concerns of the settlers and their supporters. And so if I had a bet, I would bet that when, you know, the Putin meeting just ended today, and that it could be as soon as next um, uh, Sunday, or who knows, that there will be an announcement about uh, Fargula. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, here's my last, I don't want to make a prediction, I want to be careful, but I do wonder if um, Malaya Dumin, uh, which is east of Jerusalem, we could look at it there. Um, let's just look at their pie chart for one second. And look how they voted in the last election. And see how many voted Netanyahu, all right? So the green is Netanyahu. And the Jewish home is which one? It is that one. Imagine this scenario that uh, Naftali Bennett, the leader of the Jewish home, thinks that all those green voters that voted for Netanyahu would vote for him if he's the one who calls for the annexation of Malay Abdulmin, uh, and that he could get a lot of those voters. He's counting on the fact that Netanyahu uh, doesn't want any space between him and, and uh, you know, Bennett, because he's always worried about being outflanked on the right. He had a, a very rough situation a week before the 2015 election, and uh, uh, Bennett called himself uh, an organ, donor to the Netanyahu government because he kind of cannibalized those voters. Uh, what about if Bennett, before the next election, which is going to be at latest next year, you know, makes a move and be the first to call for a unilateral annexation of Malay al -Dumi. I don't think that's an impossibility, and I think it's even possible this year. Um, so long as there's an active peace process, you weren't going to have it, but if everything is more of them, could that happen? Anyway, it's just another example of whether when you look at the settlements issue, you've got to look at a lot of variables, including uh, voting patterns. Anyway, I've talked long enough. Why don't I stop here and open it up for your questions, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, well, I'll start with the first question, David. It comes um, from Mark Friedman from the Jewish Federation of Nashville. Relative to the settlers living in the 92% of the West Bank outside the barrier, is the increase from 70,000 to 97,000 since 2008 mainly the result of natural population increase, children being born to settlers already there, or is there a marked increase in new settlers moving into this area? That's an excellent question. I don't think I, I can tell you the exact data. It's easier with uh, Malay, I, just, I mean, with the Ili League of Bantari, because they're having so many children, we could basically predict that a lot of this is homegrown. But we'll look into this and uh, get back to Mark uh, and to find out how many of these are homegrown births and how many of these are people actually moving in. The set, I mean, it is true that, and then just recently too, the government approved new units outside the barrier. But the question is, are these, are the people living in those units, how many of them are from within and how many of them are from without uh, moving in? And how many, how much of it is extending the footprint. Uh, there is some quiet understandings with the Trump administration that neither Trump nor Netanyahu want to publicize about rules about how uh, to build adjacent to build up areas. So uh, it's, it's a good question. I don't have the exact numbers. I, I'm happy to look into it and, and try to get back to it. Great, thank you very much. By the way, there are about 600 registrants for this uh, webinar, so we're not gonna be able to get to everybody's point, uh, question, but we'll do our best. Uh, my next one comes from Zachary Narrett 
Um, and I had heard this also stated uh, recently in the interview at Davos that uh, BB did with, um, with uh, Farid Zakaria. Um, how can you have a two-state solution if Israel insists, as it does currently, on retaining control of the Jordan Val River Valley? Well, this was a big issue, of course, during uh, our peace negotiations under Secretary of State Kerry. Um, the way it was put forward then was more about the security uh, control, not sovereignty, I would say, over the Jordan Valley. Uh, this prime minister has a definite point of view that Israel doesn't need to have sovereignty, does not need to have sovereignty in the Jordan Valley as long as it has security control. Uh, there were other ideas that were out there, uh, put forward by General Allen, that would enable, uh, you know, no one spoke of Palestinians at all being the ones to patrol the border. That was not even an issue. The question was, could you have Americans, NATO, other forces that Israel would feel more comfortable with there instead? Um, and here, I think you see a difference between maybe Netanyahu and some other governments. Uh, this was not the view in the Omer government. It wasn't the view in the Barak government at Camp David. The general principle there was, as Israel stands down, uh, other troops will stand up. But just for the questioner to know, no one thought that Israel, uh, that, that Palestinians would be the ones on the Jordan Valley. But even Netanyahu did not assert the need for Israeli sovereignty. The question is, who is on, on the border itself. And Netanyahu wanted the overriding authority that he could go in uh, if there was a bomb factory or something like that. So, uh, but, the, but the issue of sovereignty was not one that he contested. Right, Did, uh, how does the Jordanian government feel about, uh, about there being troops along the Jordan River Valley? The Jordanians, you know, people say, the Israelis always say, ah, the Jordanians don't want Palestinians there, but no, no one would even refer to the possibility, including the Palestinians, that there would be Palestinian troops there either. So the, the issue for the Jordanians was American or NATO, and they were fine with that. Uh, they do work very well with Israel, and uh, I think that they would, uh, you know, uh, you know, the status quo, that's Israel's quietest border is the Jordan Valley. You know, the fear is, do they uh, flood the zone? If Israel leaves, will to use the football expression, do more people try to infiltrate? The general rally view would say is, if we have American troops there, they're not going to be able to infiltrate. So, um, and that, and Jordan felt well with that. There were even rumors that there might be Americans on the east side of the Jordan River too. So, I uh, that was not a, a big issue. But for Israel and, and, and Netanyahu and Bogi Yalom, who's the defense minister, I think they believe that, uh, and this was part of the ethos of, of Zionism, of self-reliance, that uh, Israel doesn't want American protecting Israel. Israel wants Israelis protecting Israel to defend itself by itself. And, uh, you know, God forbid an American would get shot or something, and then people would, uh, would that hurt the fabric in America of U.S.-Israel relations in terms of consensus support? Um, so, I mean, that is an issue. But this was an issue that Netanyahu and Bogi Alam felt that was their decision to make, and they weren't as keen on having the professionals issue their own verdict, that the Israeli military would have their verdict. They felt as this was a political decision, and that was their verdict. Okay, great. The next question comes from Barbara Shapira. Um, what would be the safeguards for the Dead Sea, seeing that so much of it would be part of a two-state solution? I think that if you, if you want to get into the square kilometers of uh, when people talk about that, about that, the quadrant, the northwest uh, quadrant of the Dead Sea was listed as being Palestinian. Uh, the southern part below that green line there would be Israeli. So that is usually uh, when you add up how many square kilometers would the West Bank be, the Dead Sea was part of it under the Annapolis uh, formulation and the like, but how they would actually split up the minerals and things like that, uh, north and south of the Dead Sea, uh, there might have been a working group on that, but I'm not sure. But there was some kind of basic understanding, uh, certainly in the Ormer period, that Net Netanyahu did not accept it, uh, I should have. 
Great. Um, so uh, this question comes from Linda Clifton. It's really about the resource itself. She says it's a very rich resource, but can it stand alone for local use in our communities to educate locals interested in the question it raises without being presented by someone as knowledgeable as you, David? Your suggestions on how it might be brought locally would be very appreciated. I mean, if people invite me, I'm happy to come to these communities and discuss it. Um, I also welcome the 600 people on this call. If they have ideas on, uh, we always want to make improvements. So like I said, I don't want people to feel they need to have a PhD in settlement studies to, to, to optimize. So if there are any web designers out there that have ideas, you know, shoot us a line. And uh, we're always looking to, uh, you know, my staff knows it's always about accessibility. And our goal is to take complicated ideas and to make, simplify them. So the most casual reader um, would, would feel they get, viewer would get some from it. That's why we have a glossary saying, what is a settlement? What is Jerusalem? What is East Jerusalem? We're not assuming, we're, you know, we assume people could be smart, but they're not necessarily knowledgeable. So anything that improves that accessibility, we welcome those ideas. Right. And we have webinar technology like we're using today. It brings people from Washington into local communities, and we shouldn't forget the opportunity to use that in our own education as well. Um, there are people out so, there with a webinar for a group that might gain from this. Uh, we would certainly consider it. It's, it's not a coincidence that we turn to JCPA first because we know of your interest in this issue across the country, and we thought you were natural uh, for this webinar. Right. So, so feel free to come to us, and we can help uh, broker the deal too and see how we can bring David into your local communities, either physically or through uh, webinar technology. Um, how many Palestinians in the area subject to land swaps would be happy to join a Palestinian entity if there is a two-state solution? This is from Yitzhak Feldman. You know, we, uh, the, the, I mean, we basically, if I recall, we didn't, any of the land swap area was that there's zero Palestinians that would be impacted. All the Palestinians would be on, on the Palestine side, uh, we took areas where there were, uh, these are settlers in, you know, when, in, the, in the blocks that would be added to Israel, and in the areas that would go to, to the Palestinians, this is open land where there is no Israelis. We didn't want to move uh, Palestinians uh, within the Green Line, and we didn't, you know, outside the Green Line, we didn't want to move Israelis inside the Green Line. So it's, it's to try to find where the open areas and to do an exchange that way. Great. So this question is from Bob Hornstein. I'm not sure if that's Bob Hornstein from, um, from Portland, Oregon, but might be. Uh, do you show or intend to show where the Israeli checkpoints are? It has never been clear to me how many there are or what degree they truly hinder Palestinian movement. That's a very good question. I mean, the thing about checkpoints is that, uh, and it might be something that's worth it for us in terms of a future iteration to look at. We don't do that now. Part of the issue of checkpoints is it's very condition specific. If there's just a terrorist attack and they're searching for the attacker, they suddenly, you know, put makeshift uh, checkpoints there. Uh, but if there's not, you know, there's, uh, you know, now they, they, they you know, when the area is quiet, there's there's fewer checkpoints. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, this is something that uh, it's a good question, but because we thought thought it changes all the time, it would be very hard to to give a hard and fast answer. Okay. So this next question comes from Ian Muchnick. Um, what about the resource utilization of resources outside the green line? Should there be some mention of this? 8% is, I believe, kind of misleading in terms of the impact on the West Bank infrastructure and resources. And I'm glad this fellow mentioned it because this is an issue when I was a graduate, uh, an undergrad at Columbia like 35 plus years ago, I used to see books at the uh, bookstore um, and uh, in college say, the next Middle East war, water. Um, and we would hear this a lot. But technology means that this issue isn't even in the top five anymore. When we were dealing with the, with the issue in, in the negotiation with the borders, there's security arrangements, there's Jerusalem, refugees, mutual recognition, you accept the character of the other side's state. So five for five, uh, you had to get all five of those right. 
But water did not make it to the finals in the sense that um, because of water desalination, it is not a zero sum. And, and Prime Minister Netanyahu in Davos and everywhere he goes basically talks about how Israel recycles 90% of its wastewater and it's got all these desalination plants. Now clearly a Palestinian would say, well, I'd rather have the spring water, let Israel pay for the desal water, which is more expensive. But the price of the desal water keeps dropping also. And I think there's generally a view in the international community that, uh, that you know, as, as desal keeps dropping, that this is not gonna be a hindrance. So, I mean, it, it's a good question about maybe for a future iteration, but given that the water issue is not the central issue that it was 35 years ago, when if you have it, I don't, or if I have it, you don't, then uh, because it doesn't make the top five in a certain way, thankfully technology is helping us in a way that all parties can have water and it's not a zero sum game anymore. So uh, it, it's less crucial uh, than it was um, in the past. Okay, um, this next question comes from Stephen Stern, who's a professor of religious studies and Judaic studies at Gettysburg College. How does Hamas play out in the two-state settlement? Oh, very good question. I mean, it's really, I just got back from the region. Uh, Leah was with me. Um, you know, this issue of Gaza is, uh, is a big question, and uh, I could go on and on and on. So let me, let me make it, I'll try to make it short. Um, you have a new leader of Hamas, a guy by the name of Yehia Sinwar. It's the first time that Hamas is unified under a unitary command. They always had political leaders and military, what Israel would call terror leaders. The political leader, like Khaled Mashal, of the previous round, he basically lived in a hotel suite in Qatar, in Doha, and uh, the capital of Qatar. Uh, and there was a rivalry between the, the Hamas outside and inside. Sinwar, who spent 25 years in an Israeli jail, I think he had his Israeli, even uh, there was some uh, brain surgery on him when he was ill. Um, he has come around with a view like, Hamas, we got to admit what we fail and where we're good at. And we fail on, on civilian control, especially since Qatar, which is involved in a political dispute with the Saudis and the Emiratis, cannot give Hamas the money they once did. So, Qatar is out. Turkey is another country that's been supportive of Hamas, but they are in the, in the post-coup. Erdogan has got a lot of other headaches. And basically, Hamas is on their own. The number of trucks, if you want to get into this, uh, there used to be a thousand trucks. Haaretz right, did a nice piece on this a couple of weeks ago. It's down to like 360 trucks a day. Not because this was not letting trucks in, but the demand is up. And so I think Hamas is willing to turn over the keys of the P of Gaza to the PA for civilian issues, but they're not willing to turn over the guns. They want the authority, they just don't want the responsibility. Some people have called this the Hezbollah model. They want to keep the guns for the big decisions. Let someone else decide the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, civilian uh, you know, uh, authority and the like. So the question is, would the PA come into Gaza or not. Egypt is going to broker this deal because they want to create political distance between uh, Hamas and Gaza and the Islam and the uh, ISIS people in the neighboring Sinai, which I don't know if you can see on this map. I don't know if you can. I don't know if it goes that far. But uh, basically, they want to create distance and thought a, a, a reconciliation where you bring the PA in would work. But Abbas sees it more as a trap than as, a, as an opportunity. Uh, he feels that any time an Islamic Jihad or a Salafi will throw a rocket, a fire rocket, Israel will say, you're responsible, um, and he has not wanted to come in. So where does Hamas fit in all this? Hamas being largely in Gaza is not as central to this. Of course, they'd like to get more engaged in the West Bank, but Israel, the PA security cooperation, day in, day out, is keeping Hamas out of this, the West Bank. So the main issue is more of Gaza. And here you've got this unusual situation that the Hamas people want to give over the keys for the civilian control, and Abbas isn't so keen on taking them unless he gets the guns too. In this sense, the PA conditionality and the Israelis are almost interchangeable. They, they complete each other's sense. It's the one time where Israel and the PA are in perfect harmony. Uh, but so right now it's all in limbo. Adding to the mess is that the, the Minister of Intelligence in Egypt that really was the 
spearheaded behind reconciliation, uh, has just resigned. Fauzi. So I think it's all in limbo for now. Okay, great. Well, that's going to have to be the last question, David. Thank you so much for illuminating us, our field on this. This is a really uh, important subject matter. It's helping us think through the challenges that, challenges that we're, we're facing. Um, and we're going to continue to tap your expertise on this in the days to months to come. And we appreciate you being available and being a thought leader for us in the field. Um, I'd also um, urge you all to tune in on January 31st, that's this Wednesday, I believe, at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be interviewing the head of the Institute for Curriculum Services, which is a uh, joint venture of the JCRC of San Francisco and the JCPA that looks at textbooks in both public and private schools and um, helps make suggestions and changes to textbooks that might be used locally, might be used nationally, and how they portray Jews in the Middle East. And we're really excited about this. Very excited to have you all on this. And we're gonna continue this online education um, on behalf of JCPA and our field. We think it's a great way of having very rich and thoughtful conversations. And we thank you all for tuning in. Take care.